John. Um, thanks for coming. Yeah, it's great to meet um, you, Jack. Um, yeah, basically, I'm a currently I'm a member of the Evolution Complexity and Cognition Research Group, which is set up by the Free University of Brussels. It's organised by um, Francis Haligan, who uh, is an internationally known uh, cybernetician, systems thinker, and so on. Um, the I've published a book, Evolution's Arrow, about 15 papers that have been published in international science journals, peer-reviewed science journals, and basically they deal with uh, the direction of evolution, the biggest picture of all. So uh, Darwin, uh, he focused on the evolution of biological organisms and so on. Um, the uh, From a young age, I, I intuited that there, ne there needed to be and should be a more general theory of evolution um, that covered not just the evolution of um, uh, organisms, but what preceded organisms, the first life and so on. Uh, and additionally, and most importantly for us, um, the evolution of humanity, uh, including human social systems. Now, the my work's focused on the great trends or directions in this uh, comprehensive evolutionary process. And basically I've identified two directions, uh, two main trends. One is towards the formation of cooperative organisations of increasing scale. And the second is evolvability, uh, which so living systems have got better at evolving. They're better at exploring possibility space and identifying um, adaptations that are effective and so on. So uh, the importance about, uh, the critical importance about the fact that evolution has a trajectory is that once we understand the trajectories of evolution, we can identify where humanity currently stands on those trajectories and we can identify what we have to do, how we have to evolve, how we have to shape our societies and ourselves individually in order to survive and thrive into the future. Because what, what an evolutionary trajectory actually defines is what succeeds, what uh, persists. Um, and if we know the trajectory, we know what humanity has to do with our societies, our political systems, um, uh, and our individual cognition and so on, and the cognition of our political systems and, and societies, uh, their ability to adapt as a whole. Um, so uh, I argue that a proper understanding of the big picture of evolution, the trajectory of evolution, uh, answers the key existential questions that face all of us individually and collectively. Um, so these are, um, where did we come from? What are we? Um, where are we going to? And probably most importantly of all, um, what should we do with our lives? Now, that's it's a big claim that an understanding of evolution can answer the question of how we should live our life, what we should do, what our goals should be individually and collectively. Uh, it's a big claim, but uh, I'll just briefly outline how it is able to do that. Um, so I've mentioned that uh, we can identify the trajectory uh, and therefore we can identify what we have to do to survive and thrive. Uh, when we identify that trajectory, uh, we come to an extraordinary realisation, and that is the realisation that in order for the for us to survive and thrive into the future, it won't happen automatically. It, natural selection, outside forces won't uh, keep us on that trajectory. Uh, up until now, the trajectory of evolution um, from, you know, infinitesimal uh, proto-cells to cells to communities of cells to um, multicellular organisms to societies of organisms and so on, and in humans from uh, kin groups to bands to tribes to city-states, uh, empires, eventually to nation-states. Uh, th that Those great um, trends in evolution um, 
have occurred automatically. They've been driven by competition and selection and so on, and cooperation over increasing scales succeeds in that, in that competition. But from here on in, um, natural selection won't operate to drive us further along the trajectory. The reason for that is, is that uh, natural selection requires competition, a population of uh, living processes that compete with each other and the most successful survive if, if they uh, differ in heritable ways. Um, on the planet now, there are the largest scale living entities that exist are nation states. There are only there are fewer than 200 nation states. Uh, that is, and they're not competing. They're not competing effectively. There's uh, more powerful ones that dominate the the uh, the situation. So there is there's uh, evolution proce proceeds through natural selection when there is populations of uh, thousands upon thousands or millions of organisms that are competing, uh, and that drives the process. Um, the critically, the if we look at the trajectory, the next step um, where we are now as nation states are the largest living entities. The EU is arguably um, a larger cooperative entity, but the next step is clearly to move to a, a global system, and we have to do that to survive and thrive. I, I won't go into detail about that now, but um, the global entity will certainly not be subject to selection because it's not competing directly with any other global entities. Um, the, the global entity will only go through the entification process, which the cooperatives of larger scale when they emerge go through. Um, they, de they develop their own agency uh, at the level of the cooperative. Um, they can adapt as a whole and so on. Uh, the, but that's driven by selection competition between these emerging entities. Obviously, when you have a global uh, cooperative entity uh, on the scale of the planet, then it's not in competition with anything. So it's the organism that constitutes that uh, the, the main component, the most evolvable component of that global entity uh, that has to enter. Uh, be aware of what is needed to to create agency and so on on the planet as a whole, and to implement that process and drive it forward intentionally, and that's the great shift from automatic um, evolution, uh, automaticity on the trajectory to uh, intentional evolution, and that's the process that uh, arguably we are beginning to undergo slowly but surely um, on this planet, and that has to accelerate. Um, and be achieved successfully, we have to do it intentionally. Um, the I could go on about the detail, but I, no, that's good. Right. Yeah, thank you. Now that was um, a really helpful introduction, uh, giving a kind of tour um, of the of what you're doing and the importance. And I think before we, bef so, so one thing I'll say is to kind of summarize myself and let me know if this is wrong. So to, to help listeners. Evolution kind of has a, a direction of increasing cooperation, right? And in fact, that's that's meant that we've gone from say cells to multicellular organisms, and then even in our own societies, you know, nation states and bigger and bigger organizations. So that is kind of its direction is more and more cooperation, and and that culminates in, for example, the fact that we need to increase that cooperation even now, um, in our world today. And you've talked about the problems with with doing that, but no, that's why we must. Um, so if that makes sense, why don't we then um, go then into the start of this, into the details, and th and ask why does evolution have a direction, and, and and as well, why are people against this? Why is this actually um, not that common a view um, that that evolution has this kind of direction? Right. Um, the firstly, why does it have the direction? It, it, the essence is simply this that. Uh, teams um, of organisms that cooperate together and implement, for example, division of labour and specialisation can always outcompete isolated individuals. So that applies at every level. So whether it's simple protocells, communities of cells, 
communities of communities of cells or whatever, uh, the larger the scale of, of cooperation, um, the the more competitive it is. So it's, it's there's a mix between competition and cooperation. Um, but cooperation prevails eventually when you have a unified cooperative planetary society or super organism. Um, why, mm. why don't people see this? Interestingly enough, um, in the last probably uh, nearly 30 years, um, increasingly uh, the uh, was the leading thinkers in evolution are coming to this kind of conclusion. It's called major evolutionary transitions theory. Mm -hmm. um, so two guys, uh, um, John Maynard Smith and, and Ursh Sassmary, uh, published a book um, in 1995 um, about major evolutionary transitions. Um, and they weren't, it, you know, it wasn't a highly developed an abstract and unified theory, but it, it moved in that direction and it identified these major transitions, most of which lead to, uh, you know, this um, uh, wider, quite wider scale cooperatives. Um, so now the the probably the leading uh, evolutionary theorist in America, um, David Sloan Wilson, um, he mechanisms that I do, but he uh, clearly has, uh, now, you know, endorses the position that um, uh, increasing scale of cooperation has arisen and so on. He endorses the proposition that, you know, the next stage, if you extrapolate it, is the emergence of a superorganism on the scale of the planet. Um, so the, so there is you know, the increasing view. Mm -hmm. uh, he basically says that what drives it is group selection. Um, but, you know, and and I have management theory, which is which is different. But, but yeah, I, mm. I would say that the... Now, it's often not expressed as cooperation either. And, and for example, um, yeah, when, when you say that... When, it, when I say that the tra trajectory of evolution is towards cooperatives of increasing scale then people don't necessarily recognise that a nation state is a large scale cooperative entity. Um, mm -hmm. the, they don't see economic systems as cooperative. They, they actually uh, often see them as, um, uh, as competitive. They emphasise the competition and so on. And the competition is very important. But I'll, I think I should just briefly identify um, why they are cooperative. So, mm. uh, so the the competition drives uh, and markets drive an extraordinary level of cooperation once you see it. So, for example, um, the anyone you know, broadly speaking, in the world um, has under a market if a, if markets are operating effectively has an incentive. Uh, is incentivized to satisfy the needs of others. Um, mm. And they do that by developing a new product, uh, you know, or entrepreneurially getting, uh, uh, you know, capital to fund machine, relevant machinery or whatever, to produce a product which will satisfy needs. And if they do that successfully and cost effectively, um, then they profit from doing that. Uh, so mm. they satisfy someone else's need, and then their their needs is satisfied in that exchange relation. So the um, so just take any uh, product that you know we use on a day to day basis, a simple biro, for example. It, it is an example that's used in, in economics. But the if you look at a a biro, uh, a pen, you know, which has a metal casing, or it could be a plastic casing. Um, some metal components uh, and so on. And you think of, uh, you know, probably the plastic had a, an origin in uh, petroleum or, or something like that. 
uh, it was explored for, it was you know drilled, it was refined, and if you go through each of the components of a pen, you'll find that thousands upon thousands of people from all over the world have contributed to that. So all the objects, all the um, you know technology and so on we use is a result of an extraordinary cooperative um, you mm. know, activity. Um, so nation states, um, you know, to the extent that they create the conditions in which markets can operate within them, they also uh, provide public goods and so on uh, and exchange that for taxes. Uh, again, if you look at it through the lens of cooperation, it's clear uh, that what makes it extraordinary um, and creative and innovative is and beneficial in satisfying human needs is the cooperative that it is founded on cooperation. And, and I think something that that would be helpful here, because you talked about it's co it, it seems that evolution is going towards cooperation, but that there is also competition within it, right? But nevertheless, that's channeled to um, cooperation. So, would I can I ask, or, or would you have to touch on how? this process doesn't mean that people are not self-interested, that in fact it's actually precisely the case that self-interested entities, whether that be on a human scale or like within cells, that it, that's actually maintained and and that that's, that's how actually cooperation still occurs? Yes, so um, it's very basic uh, in evolutionary understanding that altruists uh, don't survive and thrive. Um, at every level, they're outcompeted, and that creates a significant barrier for the emergence of cooperation. Um, so, if an entity does a favour for another entity uh, that's costly to it, uh, and it doesn't get any return from doing that, it will be outcompeted by the entities who take the benefits without giving anything in return. Um, so, and hence the, you know, the famous book, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. And at the level that he was operating at um, and focusing on, you know, it was a reasonable, you know, conception. Uh, and this doesn't overthrow that, it just, it, it just looks at a bigger picture. Um, so the barrier to cooperation is, extra, is uh, very great for humans, for corporations, for governments, for nation states, for cells, for multicellular organisms and so on. Um, but uh, once you get, once you overcome that barrier, you succeed, you take off, you know, you outcompete the individuals that, uh, you know, that are in the population that the cooperative was formed in. Uh, so how does that happen? So um, basically the, the condition that I would suggest, uh, if it can be met, will lead to overcoming of the barrier is if entities capture the benefits of the uh, their effects on the cooperative, on the organisation or group as a whole. Um, and I call that consequence capture. So they capture the consequences of the of their actions on the the organisation of the whole. Um, so what that basically means operationally is that if you do someone a favour or you do the group a favour, you you benefit from that. Um, if you don't benefit from it, then you'll be selected against individually and you'll go out, you'll be uh, you know, eliminated from the, uh, the cooperative. So, uh, and that explains, you know, the findings of games theory which finds very limited circumstances in which uh, individuals um, can benefit by cooperating with others um, and, uh, and cooperation will therefore emerge. But what Game Theory demonstrates that, that there is no universal simple way of overcoming um, the, uh, of winning games um, cooperatively. Um, so how, mm -hmm. how, how can you get um, uh, consequence capture um, in a general way, in a way that's sustainable and will persist uh, and will be 
enable the benefits of cooperation to be selected, selectively advantaged. Um, so I, I argue in uh, my theories and so on that, that it's achieved through the emergence of a powerful entity, um, which I call management. Um, so the, when I first saw this, um, the vision I had in my mind, which seems very simple now um, and obvious, is that uh, a cell or an emerging cell, when they first emerge in evolutionary terms, um, is managed by uh, RNA um, or DNA. So it's it's the that's the manager of the cell. Um, in what sense is it a manager? Uh, in what sense does it um, implement consequence capture? Um, so the the RNA can, uh, because it has catalytic power, um, it can catalyze uh, the formation of alterus that otherwise would be selected out of the evolutionary process, the emergence of the cell. So it overcomes the, the disadvantage of altruism by actively supporting um, the uh, the ultra the altruist. Uh, additionally, a major problem to the emergence of cooperation is free riding. Uh, free riders are those at every level are those who take the benefits of cooperation without investing anything in return. So again, the RNA can use its catalytic capacity, um, its power. Uh, to eliminate free riders and, and suppress them. So I saw this equivalence between the proto-cell and the emergence of a global hum, uh, human-managed society. And at the global level, global governance um, is the management system uh, that will govern nation states, uh, which will deter free riding, theft and cheating, uh, disarm nation states. Um, disarm them of their nuclear weapons and so on. So the, the global governance has the power to govern uh, um, and promote cooperation and suppress free riding, cheating and thieving um, across the globe. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you make, oh, go on. No, no, that's, I think that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's helpful to think about basically the how of for example, you talked on that managers, actually, how can this cooperation occur despite self interests? And there you talked as well, but you touched on again, actually linking it back to current global governance in our world today. Um, before we get to that, um, to, it's kind of a, a backdrop. Um, maybe you could like go into slightly more detail on you. You talk about, um, for example, an evolution's arrow, like internal versus external man managers and basically the the ways in which we can sort of um cooperate and i think this would be helpful to go into because of sort of links to the kind of different ways we could govern ourselves in the world today um so yeah yeah there's i i should have added a little bit more on the uh the question you asked about um uh you asked me to to identify why self-interest uh, uh, is not inconsistent mm, at all with cooperation. Sure. So, That's all right. So yeah, yeah, management um, uh, makes it in the interests, whether it's within a cell, within a multicellular organism, or within a, the global, a global system or a nation state, it makes it in the interests of um, uh, entities within the system to cooperate. Um, so, and that's very good news for humanity. It means that um, cooperation at the, na the international level, global cooperation, which is essential if we're to uh, deal effectively with global warming, global environmental destruction and nuclear war, um, that global cooperation won't require human beings to become saint-like. Um, mm. What it will require instead is the implement of consequence, implementation of consequence capture by powerful management that can incentivize behavior that benefits the global system and suppresses behavior um, that undermines the global system and, and so on. So coming back to your question about, and, and this is a distinction that, yeah, when I, when I first describe management, I describe it as 
external management. So, and it's easy mm-hmm. for human beings to to conceive of and visualise and so on because we're surrounded by organisations and historically of there are human organisations in which there are powerful kings, uh, governments, CEOs of corporations. Um, you find it at you know many levels of human organisation where you have uh, an obvious uh, manager that's external to the uh, those that have been managed. You know the body of the cooperative organisation, and and if you, it's fairly easy to pick out how they use power to incentivise behaviour that supports the organisation and punishes that which doesn't. CEOs, for example, have the capacity to hire and fire. You know, which is um, and so on. And to add and to remunerate and so on to reward cooperation, um, but yeah, as you pointed out, there's there's another form of management which is a lot harder to see, um, and not many people see it. It's mistaken for you know the spontaneous emergence of bottom up organisation, um, which is very popular amongst postmodernists and and um, people at that level because they're they hate hierarchy, you know, they're viscerally um, anti-hierarchy to a, to a significant extent. Um, but the, what is this other form of management? So there's the, the external management, the, there's also internal management. So this operated in human tribes. So human tribes, initially there was no chief, there was no powerful member of the tribe who ran the show, um, they're egalitarian um, and there's abundant evidence of that um, uh, both in evolution and in current um, uh, tribal tribal groups, humans that are still in tribal groups. So the, the question is how were um, aggressive um, uh, Combative of ape men, because apes weren't in complex cooperative groups. Um, so how were the the, the how were ape, ape men uh, that compete with one another within uh, most primates? Um, the the dominant male, uh, you know, um, uh, uses its power to monopolise sexual activities and so on, reproduction, easy to see why that emerges. Um, so how were, how were, how did you get those um, eight men to cooperate together uh, in a sophisticated way uh, in a tribal society when altruism doesn't, doesn't get selected, altruism won't work, um, it'll be selected against. It involve anything that involves self-sacrifice generally will be selected against. So how do you make cooperation pay? Um, and the way it basically happens um, is that the if if predispositions to cooperate are reproduced in each member of an organization, uh, then those predispositions will capture the benefits um, of the cooperation. So it, and you need generally need one additional thing, or one additional thing really helps significantly. So it's very evident in human tribal societies, is that that cluster of predispositions, which is reproduced um, culturally throughout the tribe, uh, also predisposes the members of the tribe to punish free riders, non those who don't reciprocate in cooperative exchanges, and so on. Um, so the so that restricts and ensures that the benefits of cooperation go to these um, hardwired predispositions um, to cooperate and punish punish free riders. Um, the a similar process, a similar example um, happened with the with the emergence of multicellular organisms. And multicellular organ and, it's, and a process known as kin selection. Multicellular organisms um, basically cooper- cooperation can emerge easily because 
Um, they are uh, a single cell will give rise to other cells. All those cells will will uh, carry copies of the uh, the genotype of the original of the initiating cell, um, and therefore uh, predispositions to cooperate, um, to engage in exchange relations, and so on. Um, the will be beneficial to the to, to that genotype, um, and others won't be excluded. Now, just just to give a better a better feel for that um, at the human level, because that's where we can, you know, we all have direct experience of this. Um, the key, as I said, is first of all the hardwiring of all members of the tribe with cooperative predispositions, and that happens through the process of socialisation. At the basic level, there probably is a genetic component, but largely in humans, uh, it happens through the process of socialization. So, in other words, instilling in children, in the uh, children born into the tribe, instilling them with these uh, cooperative predispositions. And it happens now, you know, we tell our children to share, you know, our, to share uh, and be nice to others and be fair and so on. So they're, they're the cultural predispositions. Um, equally, the in a tribal society is like a, a, a small closed human community where everyone's under surveillance uh, and gossip, you know, what, so it explains why human beings are predisposed, predisposed to gossiping, um, to uh, we're preoccupied with whether people are fair or not. You see children, you know, arguing about what's fair and arguing with their parents about what's fair. Um, and the, because, because uh, we're trying to identify, or this is the evolutionary reason for these things, they drive us to identify non-cooperative cooperative, cooperators. Uh, we identify free riders. We identify people who are not, fair who try and monopolize resources and so on and then the group tends to punish them so moral outrage um, so tribal societies on the surface will be egalitarian cooperative uh, living in harmony with their environment and so on but that was in part achieved through this group punishment moral outrage at those who didn't follow the rules um, and they were expelled from the tribe and that was a sentence of death if you were expelled from the tribe um, and there's the last um, Aborigin desert Aborigines to come in to the mission in the 1930s, the last, you know, free living uh, Aborigines were a couple who had um, got together contrary to, you know, the kin rules that applied in the tribe and they were expelled and normally they would Die, but because all the other tribes that went in, all the tribes went into the mission, um, uh, they, you know, there was an abundance of, of food and so on, so they, they didn't have competition. So they were the last to go in. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that's lower level management. Pro probably uh, just to point out, religions, uh, you know, the re why, why do religions exist? You know, because on any planet where uh, life emerges, I will argue that they will give rise to a sentient organism like us and they will have religions and supernatural beliefs and so on because they have an evolutionary function. Um, selection will favour and call forth, you know, systems of religious belief and so on. Um, so the, so supernatural beliefs were a way uh, of entrenching um, the socialization process. So in other words, creating a, a tribe where it was safe and profitable to be a cooperator because um, they're all all contained the same cooperative predispositions. Um, and as parents do today, you know, they warn their children that that you know the the boogeyman will get them if they don't do the right thing and so on. So that worked for tribal societies. But tribal societies cooperated within the in the tribe, but they um, they didn't cooperate with other tribes. They were in competition with them. So the uh, outgroup uh, 
strangers, people who didn't have your cultural predispositions, you didn't cooperate with them and so on, except under restricted circumstances. Um, and often uh, the, uh, you know, the, so the, and arguably that gave rise to, you know, predispositions towards racism and so on, um, uh, you know, aggression towards mm. people who are different from you and, and so on. Now, and a really important thing is that the, an interesting thing, at least to me, is that um, that world religions um, came into existence uh, and were significantly advantaged by, uh, in evolutionary terms, because they enabled uh, larger scale cooperatives than tribes to emerge. So the key characteristic of world religions like Christianity um, is that you know you you accept difference and that you uh, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, but critically, they enabled you know empires to be um, fitted out with lower level constraints, with lower level management. Um, uh, that enable these larger scale cooperatives to emerge and overcome uh, the, uh, you know, the, the predispositions of tribal groups to, um, you know, uh, compete with other tribal groups. So yet the mm. solution of the eight men was solved by lower level cultural constraints, cult lower level cultural management. The movement to um, Larger scale cooperatives, you know, in the form of empires and nations, uh, was achieved through world religions plus the emergence of external management. Um, mm. So it was critical. External management was critically important. The, you know, kings, emperors, and their associates who had the power to um, uh, promote cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. Am I right in saying that both? That it's important that both this external management and the uh, sort of uh, internal management, like they both occur simultaneously. Is that the case that they're kind of always occurring, or uh, or are there cases where it's like say only just external management? Yeah, the, there's there's cases of just external management. So in in the case mm -hmm. of the emergence of the first cells, the first emergence of life, then you know the uh, probably RNA um, or an RNA like uh, you know, large scale mo molecules had power over a metabolism be uh, because of their size and, and so the size and, and so on. Um, and it was just external management. In the case of um, uh, human organizations, um, you know, arguably large scale corporations um, uh, you know, a largely uh, cooperative cooperation promoted through external management, although the, you know, the cultural predispositions that we have, um, uh, you know, still exist and make it easier for the external manager. And then again, you have, you have, um, you know, the selection process um, that corporations apply, um, Part of their function is to identify people with the right character and attributes. So that's mm -hmm. that is, that's a way of you know trying to have mm. piggyback on some internal management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's still and and so basically that's a general principle. It, it applies to religion, and it applies to supernatural beliefs. That the the world religions made it a lot easier for external managers, um, you know, to manage societies. Um, and it, it didn't have to be universal, you know, the, the religions, religion didn't have to be universally adopted, didn't have to be 100% effective. The external management could come in and, and for example, mm. set up systems where theft was punished, um, you know, through jail or whatever other mechanism um, where the internal management failed. But yeah, it makes it a lot easier for external managers if you've got some degree of internal management in there as well. Right, right. Thank you. That, that's just really helpful to understand 
now we kind of have the, the tools to to think about how and and why this rise in cooperation occurs and i kind of want to go on then to the world at the moment and and as well like what we can do and and how organizations today should change and one question to start this off um uh it's kind of an idea i had it might also be something that you kind of talk about too that so I'm, I'm i'm wondering what you think of this is do you think that say government um being a top down process that's sort of like an external manager um and then the market being sort of like an internal like bottom up process where it's people's individual interests to what degree do you think it's reasonable to say that the government versus the market is an example of external versus internal management and a kind of a mutual sort of symbiosis of the two yeah so yeah i would argue that external management probably is more important than internal management mm-hmm. um, in markets even. Um, so I live in Chinatown in Melbourne here and, and the Chinese community is a good example of where there is strong internal management within the Chinese community um, that, that facilitates their, their economic activities. Um, within Jewish mm-hmm. communities, as I understand it, it's similar, but uh, so, if so, the in the, within the Chinese community, for example, the um, uh, you know the you can if you're Chinese, you can it's you can put a lot more trust in other Chinese when, in economic exchanges mm. than you can amongst you know English people or or other mm. group, other cultural groups. Um, because that's part of the, uh, you know, you'll get excluded from the Chinese community if you break these, pre- these, these internal rules and so on. So the fact that that, you know, amongst certain very tight knit groups, um, you know, economic activity is is um, uh, achieved more readily and more easily and so on than it is in others indicates that yeah, there's no universal um, need for internal management to enable markets to emerge but it can mm. facilitate considerably so right. what is the what is the function of management with markets so because the you know there's a a prevailing view which is supported by you know wealthy the wealthy and powerful and and so on Ma, you know most political parties in the western world uh that markets are you know uh, often some say always, you know, the most effective way of organising cooperation. Um, and they are magical. Markets are extraordinary. So um, I, I think, I, yeah, I should just start mm-hmm. by, you know, trying to identify why markets are extraordinary, why they are a great evolutionary invention um, for exploring the benefits of cooperation. And it is because uh, within an economic market, um, as I briefly mentioned before, um, any individual anywhere in the world can capture the benefits of an innovation that satisfies um, the need of of other people uh, mm-hmm. in the world. The um, and so it incentivizes innovation considerably. People are incentivized to continually search for opportunities to satisfy unmet needs uh, Mm -hmm. through some product. Now, however, that only works if um, there is no theft, uh, if power can't be used to uh, steal, um, you know, uh, accumulated capital and so on. And this is essentially Hobbes' point. So Hobbes, mm-hmm. the you know the great English um, political philosopher, uh, basically said that without the Leviathan, without governance, then life is brutish and short, and so on. And it is because the um, people will cheat in exchanges, the powerful will manipulate exchange relations, will steal, so you get. Uh, you know, uh, coalitions of individuals, bands of thieves and robbers, you know, and so on. Hence life brutish and short. So mm. an essential function of government to make markets effective, effective is to ensure that, 
you know, people, uh, that contracts are enforceable, that agreements are enforceable, um, the theft is punished, and so on. So everything that Hobbes pointed to, um, you know, that needed, uh, that unless it was um, dealt with, uh, then it would lead to life being nasty and brutish and short. Um, require everything to fix all those problems. You need governance. You need power, and you need power that you know, has some intention to regulate the market effectively. But that's mm. not the only problem. So so governments have to set up the framework within which exchange relations uh, can reliably be undertaken and safely be undertaken. Um, the other problem with markets is, is that they only deal with um, satisfying needs that can be satisfied by some uh, product uh, where in, in relation to which the benefits of the product can be uh, enjoyed only by the person who buys the product. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, uh, and this, you know, is the, so if you have a, a product that, uh, that uh, whose, whose benefits, you know, um, can't be limited to individuals who pay for that product, then you will get under provision of that that product. It won't be optimal. It won't be in the interests because the the uh, manufacturer or producer of that product doesn't capture all the benefits um, of that product. Then it'll be underprovided, you know, compared with the ideal. Um, the obverse of that kind of situation is that um, where the production of a product uh, produces harms that that you know extend beyond just the individual who purchases the product. It's okay if the you know it harms the purchaser because then they make a decision, a trade-off between their needs and the harms. But if it has uh, general harms, um, then it um, uh, that are uncaptured by the um, purchaser of the product, um, then it'll, then the market system, if it doesn't have additional regulation, will in, will um, incentivize, uh, well, will deter um, reduction in those harms. So the producer will have will be incentivized to externalize as much as possible of the costs of um, uh, of the effects of his products. Um, and that's, of course, an externality. Um, mm -hmm. And so an extern extern externalities are not insignificant in the sense that externalities that are driving environmental destruction and in particular global warming, um, you know, will likely terminate human civilization this century if, um, you know, uh, governance uh, that restrains the, the production of carbon dioxide either through taxation by deterring um, you know, the production of carbon dioxide above a certain amount and so on. Um, without that, then, then yeah. So, mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, so externality is very significant, so you need governance for that. Um, yeah, the, the classic example of, uh, or the classic category of examples of the first problem I mentioned, that is when you have uh, products that satisfy human needs that can't be restricted only to the purchases of those products are public goods and so on. Mm. And public goods include, you know, the framework for the market, um, the uh, measures that need to be taken to internalise externalities and so on. So they're oh, all okay. functions of governance, without which um, the 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 markets alone will not, you know, satisfy human needs. So I'll yeah. just sum it up in one thing as well sure. that the that because I this leads into a you know a conception I have of a new way of organising governance. Um, the 
in the horizontal market, I'll call it the, the the economic market I'll refer to as horizontal markets because they don't involve hierarchy in the market, you know, in the mm-hmm. market structure itself. There's exchange relations between uh, equal equals most of, when it's most effective. Um, it satisfies you know a certain category of human needs, those that can be uh, you know dealt with within the market system. But all all other human needs, um, which can't be met, you know, through the market mechanism that's restricted in the way I've outlined, all other human needs can only be met through governance. Um, so public goods, um, market framework, and so on, can only be met through governance. So if government governance is limited, as our current governance is, or, and I can discuss that, then mm-hmm. Um, the uh, the subset of human needs that can't be dealt with in the market uh, will not be optimally provided. The our, our current arrangements won't self self organize. They'll self organize um, the products in the that are that are uh, can be dealt with within the horizontal or economic market. So there's an invisible hand process mm-hmm. that um, Adam Smith famously identified, uh, which you know can, in mod- more modern terms, can be called self-organisation. So individuals just follow their own interests in a market, and that will satisfy you know um, our needs. So there's 40 different kinds of cereal, breakfast cereal, mm-hmm. you know, on the shelves when we when we go to a supermarket, um, but the we all I would argue we also need an invisible hand process that's as equally as creative, innovative, um, and self-organising for the all the things you can't buy in the horizontal market, uh-huh. and I call that a vertical market. In any event, I've covered a lot of territory there, so yeah, yeah, that's that, that's really good um, to help us think about government market and then how to and so let's let's get into like kind of a vision for then yeah what what can we do what is is a a, a, the the world supposed to look like but one one sort of caveat to to that or a thing that's important to say is when like a priori someone might think about okay you know cooperation is rising and we need to participate in that process of evolution someone might think this is just kind of like is it like global communism is it just like global like or conversely is it just complete globalization like complete markets and everything is like there's no nation state so like it, would, it might be helpful to think about why is it not those two sort of extremes but you know then what precisely is this governance structure yeah so i've dealt i think uh with the issue of why the a global market alone is insufficient mm-hmm. and why you also need global governance so you um the the uh and it's obvious, you know, there are public goods that the market can't provide, and there are externalities and so on, and they're they're uh, going to destroy us if there if there aren't governance structures that can reach across the planet. Yeah, uh, you, you've also talked about why it can't just be, you know, government because you talked about the benefits of the market, right? So, so then maybe like the the thing is the question is then more like what is the 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 middle ground? What is the new thing that that could somehow be like a mix of both, but then maybe even beyond that, if that makes yeah. sense. So, mm-hmm. so on on the issue of, um, uh, you know, will the governance be totalitarian, mm-hmm. exploitative, um, uh, benefit primarily an elite, while the great majority of human beings on the globe will be, uh, you know, wage slaves and so on. Um, the so in the evolutionary process. Um, I've said that, you know, that the the stepwise process of where you get cooperatives and then cooperatives of cooperatives and then cooperatives of those and so on, um, that's driven automatically by natural selection. So, if if you so, what typically happens at each of these major evolutionary steps, major evolutionary transitions, is that you get the emergence, uh, the cooperation barrier. Is surmounted when you get comprehensively only when you get the emergence of a powerful entity, 
uh, or you know, population of powerful entities that initially begin by exploiting um, you know, the entities that, uh, at that level. Um, so they exploit them, um, they can plunder and move on and plunder another lot and so on. And the, you know, the example in, in humans is um, you know, the Mongol tribes that uh, begun by uh, you know, attacking civilizations, plundering them, moving on, plundering the next one, moving on and so on. So then you get uh, the next step in the evolutionary process is when uh, a, a, a variant of these um, powerful entities develops the capacity to uh, manage the uh, manage a group of smaller scale entities and promote cooperation amongst them through the mechanisms I've explained, free riding, support and cooperation and so on. So um, the, you know, why, how could they outcompete the, the plunderers, the exploiters and so on? They do so because um, instead of just plundering a group once and then moving on and plundering another one and so on, um, they uh, can stick with the one group and if they manage it effectively, it has, they can enhance its productivity by promoting cooperation. And in, in effect, the Mongol tribes went through this sequence of um, steps very quickly. So the, uh, you know, the son of, of Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, you know, ended up um, being the governor or the manager mm -hmm. of China. Um, so instead of, you know, having to uh, rape, rape and pillage China once and then moving on to something else, he stayed there uh, and he was a very effective governor. You know, it was a, very, it was, um, a highly uh, productive civilization because of the effective governance that, that um, he implemented. Um, so that's the sort of sequence. Um, but then the issue becomes, well, when you uh, in effect farm uh, an organisation of entities at the lower level, manage them, increase their productivity by promoting cooperation, um, what's to stop you from you know, exploiting them for your short term evolutionary interests and so on? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that if there are, if there's a large population of these managed cooperatives competing with one another, then the 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 one that will win out or the ones that will win out will be those that are more effective at promoting cooperation because they will um, you know, be able to outcompete the ones that are uh, where the manager is engaging in exploitation and so on. So again, as I've uh, mentioned before, um, in human societies, we don't have you know, a large number of cooperatives and when we get to a global society, it's not competing with any other global society. So what what will uh, align the interests of the manager with the, or the interests of the governor with the interests of the society as a whole? So that's that's where intentional evolution comes in. Um, mm. at, at previous levels, natural selection aligned the interests of the manager with the managed organization because it's shared the same fate as the managed organization. Um, the at the the global level, you know, uh, natural selection doesn't operate to uh, discipline the management structure. So through intentional evolution, we will have to uh, set up structures that constrain the government, extrain, mm -hmm. constrain the processes that establish governance. Uh, and you can see this once you, once it's understood that you know the the evolutionary forces that drive that and that point us in that direction, you can see that historically that's what's happened in human societies. So as the number of um, uh, managed organisations, kingdoms reduced, uh, then eventually you had, um, well, the, the nobles rebelled in Britain and, you mm. know, uh, a thousand years ago, the um, 
we had the Magna Carta, and that constrained the king. That mm. in the absence of you know vigorous cooperation and a very large population that constrained the the king, the Magna Carta was an intentional attempt by the nobles to ensure the king was constrained and his interests were more aligned with their interests at least. Then you have the French Revolution, the emergence of democracy and so on. So in evolutionary terms, within this bigger picture framework, democracy is a way of constraining governments um, mm. to more align their interests with the interests of the the governed, with the society as a whole. Um, and, you know, and a global society needs to be the, the processes that establish governance need to be similarly constrained. So a major task um, of the inventors of, you know, a global system will be how do you constrain the constrainers? How do you govern the governors? How do you, and, you know, you can have multiple levels. So you have the, at, at the moment, you know, in a typical parliamentary democracy, we have elections that constrain the uh, um, the governors by choosing those with particular characteristics, um, hopefully honesty and decency and so on. Um, and then we have above them, we have the constitution and the constitution um, constrains, you know, significantly what the, uh, what the legislators can do. So, you know, that's the, the science that that's a domain that will have you know that human beings will have to uh, develop uh, you know effective method methods of, of constraining the um, the governors. There's one way um, one way in which internal uh, management can have an effect on the governors the governed uh, is if they adopt an evolutionary worldview. Um, mm. So, in other words, if if the uh, you know if, if the people in the world who are powerful recognise the evolutionary history that's led to to them and our current societies, sees the need for a global system that prevents nuclear war and global warming and so on, um, and sees that that's you know the evolutionary destiny of humanity, and that if if in effect they individually personally, uh, you know, make the transition to intentional evolution, if they become intentional evolutionaries, um, then they will be predisposed by their you know evolutionary belief system, their evolutionary worldview, uh, to set up governance in a way that's constrained, that aligns their interests, they won't be exploitative. They will embrace the the task of uh, not just creating a global system that just sits there and does nothing, but develops further, develops, you know, goes through the edification process, develops a global brain, adapts mm -hmm. as a whole, has agency, has plans, and eventually meets other global entities, other global super organisms, because you know we're not alone. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing. Once you understand how you know the mechanism by which life originated, and, and then the repetitions of that same kind of architecture that leads to each step in the trajectory, you see that it you know it it's not improbable. It's not a rare unusual freakish event um so just as just as you have cooperatives of you know nations to form a global entity there will be other global entities that mm -hmm. will, will because for the the other global entities to emerge and develop they will have the 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 intelligent entities that constitute them and organize them will have to develop an evolutionary and embrace an evolutionary worldview as well Mm. And that will lead, you know, them to um, the linking up. Now, the linking up mightn't involve, you know, meeting up in space. It's mm -hmm. far easier and quicker to communicate, you know, with the speed of light through messaging systems and so on. So, in any event, 
uh, I should return to the planet. Yeah, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's good. Um, uh, you know, like uh, let's. I um, it would be cool to go into like uh, specifics or like just think more about this. How it would look now in our like a reigning time here. One thing I'll do if it's okay, and then you maybe you could comment on it if you want. Otherwise, I'll just ask a question. Is just read a quote from your Evolutionary Manifesto, which kind of it helps summarize what you're talking about and like just for the audience, like kind of what this would look like. So uh, here's where it is. So. Um, eventually, gov government, government itself will be replaced by far more intelligent and adaptable processes that utilize the dynamism, creativity, and energy of properly managed markets. Use is likely to be made of markets and governments, including markets in market structures. These will process, processes will continue to adapt governments to maximize freedom while ensuring that the interests of all are aligned with the interests of global civilization. And I think that that kind of helps think about the differentiation, but also the, the integration of all this. Um, one well, one interesting way I wanted to go into this was um, you might have touched on it with John Vivaki, but I'm interested in your thoughts on like specifically if we could actually model um, governance in our world today off of like already governed governed already evolved governance structures like brains and nervous systems um, because John Vivaki talks about the ways actually in which we could use for example the way the way brains are like set up in neural network type um uh network structures um that can facilitate sort of creativity whilst also maintaining stability um and he, and he talks actually been recently about how maybe you could set up corporations or organizations in this way so i'm wondering what you think about actually using like specifics of what, what kind of has been already achieved in evolution to to sort of model the ways in which we we change our world today yeah well that yeah, I, I focused a lot on that when I, <clears throat> I was developing these ideas because mm -hmm. of the antipathy that exists towards government and the belief that, you know, government will exploit and particularly in America, um, you know, where I think I've said once that uh, supporters of global governance are on a lower scale socially than pedophiles. Um, and <laughs> the... Uh, you know, government's on the nose in general in America, but and global governance is more and more on the nose. So, yeah, I focused a lot on that, and and the the uh, the idea I developed essentially um, bears on this distinction I made between horizontal economic markets uh, and the vertical system. Um, that establishes public goods and that regulates markets and so on. And I see the possibility that that could be replaced, that could be replaced by a vertical market. So just as we have a horizontal market, where, mm -hmm. which is based on exchange relations, where uh, products are produced uh, to meet unmet needs and they can be exchanged for money and so on, you can have vertical exchange relations. And there, the products would be uh, institutions or legislation or mm. elements of, of governance, you know, a court system, uh, enforcement systems, penal systems, and so on. Uh, yeah, and yeah, proposals to, to overcome the tragedy of the commons, um, to deal with global warming, uh, because currently our, <laughs> our system self-organises not in the interest of the whole, not in the interest of society, but it's self-organising the destruction of human civilization. Self-organising in the sense that if individuals just follow their own interests and corporations follow their own interests, then um, yeah, they'll destroy uh, what's necessary to support and sustain civilization. Um, so this, how would, a how would this vertical market work? So mm -hmm. um, basically, the you know uh, anyone could be a producer. A producer would be a producer of a product that would be for sale in a vertical market. It would be someone who uh, develops a more effective you know legislation, mm -hmm. public good, or system for providing a public good, um, or whatever. In anything that you know, can't be bought and sold in the uh, 
economic horizontal market, but is of benefit to human beings, you know, including regulation of the the economic market. Um, the can you hear that or? No, a bit. Don't worry. Okay. Um, so, uh, so a producer, so just as in an economic market, anyone, uh, you know, can develop a product for sale. Anyone, corporations, you know, associations, individuals could develop products. Um, the consumer would not be individuals, and that's a critical distinction. That's what makes it a vertical market. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, rather than a, a horizontal market, because the beneficiaries of of uh, products that are uh, saleable in the vertical market, uh, the beneficiaries are collectives. Mm -hmm. So the the you know the framework um, that regulates an economic market um, benefits the society as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. So it's the society as a whole that would be the consumer. Uh, a particular public good, however, might um, you know, benefit a, a subset of people. So they would be the purchaser. That subset would be the purchaser. Externalities might, you know, the solution to a, the fixing of an externality might benefit, you know, the society as a whole or particular parts mm -hmm, of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So in each case, the the decision would be made by the relevant collective that um, mm -hmm. uh, that ensures that if the producer of the public good um, can capture the benefits, all the benefits, right. by, by selling it to the collective and the you know, the relevant collective, the principle of subsidiarity would apply. Um, so that's where. Uh, it will automatically emerge in a vertical market where uh, issues are dealt with at the lowest level of governance possible. Um, so, mm. so that's why, for just quickly on uh, global governance, would not usurp every function of nation states or local governments mm. or whatever. Um, uh, things would be dealt with uh, if they were if if an issue affected only um, a particular nation or only a, at the level of a nation, could be dealt with at the level of a nation without any spillover effects, then it wouldn't be dealt with by the global governance, it would be dealt with by national governments or local government or whatever. That's the principle of subsidiarity. Mm. And subsidiarity would, would self-organise in this vertical market type of system. Mm. So, the, so it's a disaggregation. Uh, this vertical market is a disaggregation of the products of governance uh, and exchange relations, which ensure that consequence capture applies, um, would be the, the mechanism. So collective is buying off producers. Producers would compete to satisfy the needs mm -hmm. of the collectives and so on. Um, uh, and anyone could there'd be no you know there'd be no barriers to entry. Um, the to to try and illustrate because uh, this is a, it's a very abstract conception mm. that I'm I'm referring uh, that I'm outlining here uh, to try and illustrate the difference between uh, you know a, a horizontal market and our current systems of governance using a vertical market concept. So, uh, if you have elections every four years, then the consumers um, are in effect purchasing uh, the all the functions of governance that they want um, in one collection, and they've got two choices. So it's a whole bag of they they're not disaggregated all the elements of, of governance that they can make a choice about um, are all in one basket and they have either one basket or the other because basically nearly all democratic systems are, are two-party states um, mm. in essence. Um, so that's like if as a consumer of, you know, in a 
in a horizontal economic market, if consumers had to buy all the goods and services you know that they wanted, uh, and they could only choose it every four years, and they only had a choice between two baskets of goods, mm-hmm. you know, and that would lead to a you know um, a market system produces far more variety. Um, and harnesses far more mm-hmm. creativity mm-hmm. than that. If you, redu- you to contemplate that you would, you know, reduce an economic market to that kind of uh, system would be an absurdity. But that's how our current vertical right. system operates that way. Um, so no, that- yeah, I, I th- one thing I was just going to point out, sure. yeah, an important point actually, that the um, the one aspect of economic markets that leads to their extraordinary creativity and diversification and variety is that uh, you know everyone's in, because everyone's potentially a producer and they're incentivized to you know produce if they can uh, do it successfully. There's everyone's searching for an unmet need. So a need, amongst those needs that can be satisfied in the horizontal market, you have this massive incentivization, low barriers to entry to uh, satisfy that need. So in, a ver- you, in the vertical market sort of um, structure I'm, I've outlined, equally uh, producers in the vertical market are incentivized to find unmet needs. Mm. So, the you know an entrepreneur, entrepreneur who wants to, driven by his self interest, who wants to um, you know be a billionaire, uh, if he can wake up one morning and discover an unmet need, you know an externality mm. that is not um, been that hasn't been internalised and appropriately regulated, uh, a tragedy of the common somewhere, you know. So entrepreneurs in the mm-hmm. vertical market. That's on their mm-hmm. Christmas list is to find right. unmet needs. Uh, mm. Compare that with with how unmet needs are identified and and dealt with in our current system of governance. Um, you know the because there's there's no exchange relation there except once every four years between mm. a, um, twiddly d and twiddly dumb. Um, the there's no great incentivization or whatever this and there's no mechanism um to make it worthwhile to invest considerable resources in discovering unmet needs and also in mm. devising complex um products to meet those needs so I, I think one further example i'll give is you know um forms of um uh, uh, e-democracy, um, you know, where you have, uh, I think it exists in California, for example, the ability to uh, make proposals that, if they get sufficient support, will be put to the vote. So you that mm-hmm. disaggre- disaggregates governance to an extent. Where, but the vertical market concept can be used to evaluate that kind of process against the vertical market ideal and see whether it's deficient and the extent to which it's deficient and so on. Um, and where those disaggregated, you know, hyper de- hyper democratic systems fail is that they don't provide any um, return for major investments in developing proposals. Um, mm-hmm. So, the under a vertical market system, you know, the, the uh, you know considerable investments can be made in developing the you know products, um, just as they are on the horizontal market. Considerable investments can be made and be rational because the um, there's a return on those there's potential return on those investments mm-hmm. through the through the um, vertical market exchange relations. 
Oh, that was good. That was really interesting. And it kind of makes me think of um, like sort of a, a movement of like digital nomads and sort of like moving about and, and sort of having almost, as you say, kind of like these actually in a way, would you say that something like it's actually having like governance structures compete with each other in a way and 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 actually like trying to to um, provide things of benefit, like, for example, even competing on public goods, on legal structures and things like this. Um, is that a reasonable way to think of it? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, yeah, there's some steps in that direction now. There's, um, uh, you know, there's, I mean, in a way, Hong Kong and Singapore were, you know, experiments in different governance structures that, that proved very successful. But, yeah, so if you have particularly if you have uh, vertical markets that operate to some extent in local government, um, you know, in small scale, then there'll be enormous competition um, amongst producers to come up with solutions because the, there'll be, you know, there'll mm. be a, the market won't be really thin. At the global level, um, probably less so, but, but, uh, but maybe overcome because, because what, what I would emphasise uh, mm. is that um, the it, the things that emerge in a in a vertical market system uh, that I've outlined will be as unpredictable, unforeseeable, and unforeseen as the products that emerge mm -hmm. in a horizontal market. Um, right. So it's it's not a matter of of saying oh what will the vertical market do about you know how will it achieve this mm -hmm. particular end or that particular end how will it do it what will the products look like what will you know how will the court system be how will the other systems be because they will be subject to this they'll unleash this creative um, power of exchange relations competitive exchange relations um, and mm -hmm. before long it'll be yeah, there'll be it'll be like forty different serials, um, right? Uh, which would be utterly unpredictable twenty years ago. What you know, the yeah technological progress and so on. It'll the we we have this enormous um, brain power that's directed at developing you know a tastier breakfast cereal mm. uh, or some element of technology. That far exceeds, you know, the brain power that's put into developing, uh, you know, aspects of governance. Yeah, public goods or things like this. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. when you look at it from that broader perspective, it is, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one question I had was. Um, you know, or just to, 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 to note on that, like there's actually a book called The Machinery of Freedom by this economist, David Friedman, which is really interesting because it kind of talks to you to this point exactly, which is like he, he talks about how actually like we just don't let free, free markets sort of develop these things, but actually you could have, and he goes into detail about what a legal system could look like, like like if you let free markets develop it, right? And and as well, they kind of naturally emerge, you know, to you know, when, when governments don't do not do things right. And that leads me on to like another question on like this emergent, like in trying to think of how actually one gets to this kind of point um, is, you know, in, in major evolutionary transitions, um, it seems that they kind of, they occur sort of like, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. It seems that they kind of occur like sort of suddenly, like it's actually like a leap in the way things are organized, say from like a cell to multicellular organism. So I'm wondering like, Will the rate of change, will this be like a steady progression like to new kinds of government structures or like could it be sudden and I wonder if things like AI, climate change, if if that changes the nature of the problem that we face at the moment? If this makes sense, let me know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that comes down to the practical issue of how, because, mm -hmm. the, you know, the vertical market system is very abstract. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the most human beings wouldn't be able to load it into their head and and understand how it could function and and so on. Um, the, so you know, can is it likely to be adopted through democratic processes or 
uh, what kind of processes might lead to the mm. change in the world. Um, in essence, the the in a way of speaking, uh, you know, the things that are threatening, that are existential threats to humanity at the moment, are tending to call into existence, you know, the global superorganism, uh, mm-hmm. underpinned by a system of global governance, and because without it, you know, the the big show on this planet will end. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's only through luck that we haven't destroyed ourselves through a nuclear war. I mean, absolute luck. Um, the, you know, it nearly ended in the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was a nuclear-armed Russian submarine um, that was being depth-bombed by the American blockade and uh, the, the Russians had set up the submarine system so that th- uh, three people had to, the three people who decided had to agree, you know, so one could veto it. Two decided to shoot off their nuclear weapons at, uh, at America, which would have you know, been the end of everything. And one mm. vetoed it. And he should go down in history, you know, as a hero, but he's Russian, so he he, <laughs> he won't. Right. But, yeah, that's how close we've got. So, I mean, th- these existential mm-hmm. threats are real. And you can, you the only way you can uh, uh, you know, prevent nuclear war, because even Pakistan has nuclear weapons now. I mean, Pakistan. The, bye, bye. <laughs> um, so the only way you can prevent it is through a power that stands above nation states and controls them. So you need you need a repetition of what happened with the formation of the US. So the the states in America fought wars against each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the the formation of the United States with a federal governance structure that reached across and had the power to regulate states now makes war of one state against another in America unthinkable. I mean, they don't have the weapons, that, you know, so it disarmed them. So global governance is just the repetition of that process at the global level. So those who say that it's you know just pie in the sky and and you know there'll never be a global system and it's just ridiculous and you know mm-hmm. nations are disagree with one another how will you get you know this global system um, you know the formation of the United States is an example of where uh, that demonstrated that it isn't impossible unthinkable and so on uh, but how might it happen so I mean it's possible that. You know, we will be, um, civilization will be destroyed in the next 20, 30 years. Um, how might that not happen? So, one way um, is the emergence of a, you know, powerful entity that has the ability and the will to uh, impose its will. You know, it's big enough and powerful enough to impose its will. That's what's happened at previous levels. Um, Although it's hard to imagine now, Great Britain once had an empire. You know, it's just mm-hmm. <laughs> the the you, <laughs> yeah. You know, England had an empire. That crummy little island, dreary, you know, rain-ridden, mold, mildewy island, which has been described yeah. described brilliantly by an ex-prime minister in Australia, Paul Keating. Um, as an ageing theme park, a dilapidated theme park, sliding slowly but surely into into the Atlantic Ocean. But anyway, it had an empire once, and it, the empire spanned the world. I mean, you mightn't believe this, but it, it actually did. And there was a time when it had the opportunity. It could have, you know, instituted a global system, but no one was thinking along those lines at the time, and you know, it, it, you know, it, there wasn't any theoretical or, or philosophical underpinning to it. Mm-hmm. 
the United States was in a position where it could have done that. Uh, it isn't now. The next cab off the rank, you know, is China. So the if I could, you know, had the opportunity to pitch the evolutionary worldview <laughs> right. um, to China, you know, it'd be off like a shot. Um, I'm surprised that Z hasn't rung me yet, you know, to find out. Yeah. But, but, but the, but it's not inconceivable that, you know, China might be, you know, it's, it's got the power. It will have the power. It's now the biggest economy in the world, bigger than the US economy. Um, yeah, you know, it might have the power to, in coalition with other countries or whatever, build up sufficient capacity to, you know, institute a global system. And it might do it exploitatively, but not if it's, you know, if it embraces and, and is motivated by an evolutionary worldview. Um, the, and, you know, how could you sell an evolutionary worldview to, you know, the the people who run China. I mean, basically, as I said, the the evolutionary worldview, you know, points to what humanity must do to thrive and survive into the future. Um, and those individual humans, or the individual, you know, who embraces an evolutionary worldview, promulgates it, moves to a global system, as an intentional evolutionary and so on, will go down not just in history, you know, it'll be an, an extraordinarily historic event, um, but they'll go down in evolutionary history as well. You know, they'll, it'll be mm -hmm. a major evolutionary transition on this planet. So individually, um, you know, if they're self-interested, ego-driven, then it's a very attractive prospect yeah um you know to go down in to be un, unforgettable in human history and save the planet so in, in any event the but all i just add to that is that the you know there's another possibility i've written about um as well and that because this it's the whole issue of to deal with our existential crises you need power that can reach across the globe where can that power come from so one possibility is as i've outlined you know the most uh, the emergence of a very powerful nation and its alliances with other sufficient other nations to take over the whole show um hopefully motivated by uh, an evolutionary worldview that will ensure that they set it up so that they do go down in history, not as world exploiters, but as um, setting up the global superorganism, setting it up with vertical markets, setting it up mm -hmm. so that they they sell, they're, they're constrained. I mean, that's to go down in history, to go down in evolutionary history, you have to set up systems that constrain your your own power so that your mm -hmm. interests are aligned with those of the, the whole show in any event are there any other potential sources of power and uh, one is um which is counterintuitive to an extent and uh objectionable to you know many many is that a coalition of billionaires um with uh what you know whatever nation states um, they can co-opt. Um, so a coalition of billionaires, um, uh, you know, has the economic power to um, implement an organisation of the of the one percent, say, but it's mm -hmm. less, than, you know, the the mega wealthy. They have the the power, a, a co an emerging coalition of them can implement a tribal kind of um, cooperative system amongst the, the hyper-wealthy um, because they have the power to, um, you know, punish, visit group punishment um, and so on, and incentivize others and so on. So they could build 
uh, you know, a, a power that was uh, able to implement a global a system of global governance, because basically the the this will seem less fanciful if it's recognised once a person recognises that the wealthy and powerful currently uh, determine uh, what governments. Um, Mm. Uh, yeah, come into power. I think it was Ted Cruz who, um, when he got uh, beaten by Trump in the final vote, you know, for the Republican nominee for the 2016 president presidential race, he said that um, that the uh, he didn't succeed because Murdoch, who's the most powerful Australian, you know, he the media magnate Rupert Murdoch owns Fox News and key media in the UK and Australia. Cruz said he determines who, you know, leads the UK, Australia and the US. Um, mm. And he's, he's a Republican. But in any event, the, the 1% through control of the media and someone, and it's not an organised conspiracy. It's a distributed, a distributed mm. system, and it's beset with the same kinds of collective action traps and so on as as other unorganised, unmanaged groups. But um, but they have considerable power. And right. now, the what makes it even less fanciful, and what drives more strongly, you know any of these kind of scenarios where you get coalitions that have the power you know to implement a global system is that as the world deteriorates uh, things that were unthinkable become to be demanded you know by the circumstances um, everyone's interests get aligned just as they do if an asteroid's um, bearing down on the planet uh, and nations know that if they free ride and they don't, you know, contribute to the a response that can deal that can destroy that asteroid, then then if they don't, that you know they'll be destroyed if any and so on. Mm -hmm. So the we'll all be in the one boat. So as I say, right. as I say, um, if a ship's absolutely going to sink, uh, even the rats, you know, will stay on the ship and try and man the pumps to save yeah. the ship. Because uh, if there's no way, avenue of escape. So, mm. you know, and, and billionaires are trying to find avenues of escape. You know, they're buying up New Zealand, um, you know, hideaways, uh, mm. uh, you know, the, where they can survive the, um, you know, the disintegration of the northern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. uh, so, this, this, sorry, go on. I don't want to stop you. Yeah, no, no. I was, that, that, so that was good. But, but yeah, if you if you know, yeah, when things get bad enough, um, then we're all in the one boat. Interests right, right. are unified. And and so I'm one of my goals, you know, because I'm trying to influence the future fate of humanity and its evolution as an evolutionary, you know, an intentional evolutionary. One of my goals is to plant that seed and, and try and promote it so that as things go bad, they'll have to go, they'll only have to go less bad before, you know, because people people have thought of those kind of possibilities, they'll consider those possibilities at an earlier stage of disintegration than they would otherwise. So Yeah. Yeah. This is the so again, I don't want to keep you here for too long because I know it's getting late, but there's one final thing. It might be a kind of point of disagreement or more just an idea or just just thinking about this. Um is um you know, it's very interesting that you bring up like British Empire or America. They kind of, in a way, you could say, had the opportunity to create 
a sort of um let's say a super organism right at that, that point as they were the dominant um power structure um but it, it makes me think that um perhaps this the view that they, they could have done it but didn't is maybe like one is perhaps it's a bit too thinking that it that this could emerge too much in a top-down way because for example there's you know you could argue that the there was kind of a global system like say in the late 1800s with like uh with the gold standard but that kind of like um safety and amos and economists kind of makes an argument that it kind of inevitably we inevitably kind of like the the gold standard disintegrated and there was a kind of um um again then the u.s kind of it's dominant for a while but then there's still that conflict with the ussr so that it's kind of like an inability to sort of create that sort of super organism i mean so one point that makes me me think of and i wonder what you think of it is perhaps at those moments there couldn't really have been a super organism that emerged um perhaps because it makes you think maybe the technologies maybe maybe actually things it wasn't possible um to do it at that moment but that then makes me want to hear your opinions on like i don't say technologies like uh like Bitcoin or or NFTs, like or or even like different mechanisms that like of funding public goods from like the Ethereum community, like and I, again, I don't you know, might not be in your sort of wheelhouse, but I'm just wondering, you know, perhaps it, it's only the case that through newer technologies, like that, I say at the present present at the moment, could we actually feasibly create a kind of super organism that would work? I don't know what you think of this. Um, so I, I can phrase yeah. it in a specific question: is is yeah, no, I mean. You know, I think there's a lot of validity in what you're saying um, in the sense that, uh, you know, the enormous development in communication um, technology is definitely facilitates coordination mm -hmm. on wider scales without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I went to Vietnam about 20 years ago now it is, but, the, but I, I saw the, um, you know, the command centre in the um for the u.s forces uh in what's now called ho chi minh city um and they're all plastic phones you know it was, it, it really it right. was just it, it was startling yeah the difference to because because the um vietnamese have preserved it and turned it into a tourist attraction um because they beat the ho chi ho chi minh beat the you know Mm -hmm. biggest nation on earth and before that he threw the french out i mean it's extraordinary what he achieved mm -hmm. um but um but yeah the you know the the on the other side of it the you know the roman empire you know potentially could have you know uh, there's no right. i don't yeah. think there's any technical impediment as to why it couldn't have extended across the globe um you know in terms of communication coordination and so on but um but it's a lot easier now absolutely but uh, yeah i'd just say it never occurred to, in the us or the uk to, in, to inf impose a global system um and they would have you know there weren't the demands for it so the demand now is extraordinary once you realize that without a global system you know, this yeah. whole show ends. So um, I think that changes. That's a massive change, but technological advances have definitely improved it. There's the issue of bottom-up, because as I said, um, people at the postmodern level of cognitive development, um, so mm -hmm. they're, they're green on the spiral dynamics scale or the, I don't know if you've, you've looked at, development cog levels of cognitive development and cultural development of human beings yeah i'm familiar with that i don't know if my list is what it would be but you, you can you can go on without explaining it, it yeah no I, I went, oh yeah I won't, <laughs> I, won't, <laughs> I won't explain it but but there are diff different levels of human beings different species of human beings almost on the planet um you know like someone who votes for trump you know is is at a different cognitive level uh, most of them, because it's not in their interest to, you know, they're they're at the blue level in spiral dynamics and so on. So it's to to look at what can arise bottom up. It's really important to have 
you know, an understanding of the levels at which humanity are and therefore the possibilities that can emerge and so on. But um, the yeah, I can't see any feasible bottom-up process um, that could emerge in time uh, where amongst individuals who saw the need for go global governance, for example. Um, the, right. Because, as I said, in the United States of America, I mean, the, the very obvious reason why um, supporters of global governance are ranked lower than pedophiles in, in the US, it's because the, US, the last thing that the people who determine, uh, you know, the contents of consciousness of the people of America, you know, that is the wealthy and powerful in America, um, the last thing they want is a body, you know, ceding power to a body that's uh, more powerful and can regulate the United States of America. Um, you know, if, if there was a body that did that, for example, um, you know, that had that power, then there wouldn't have been mm -hmm. no Vietnam War or if they had a gone ahead regardless, Kissinger, you know, who's, um, you know, a key figure amongst others responsible for the the death of six million, six million um, people in Southeast Asia, including mm -hmm. bombing Cambodia into the Stone Age and making Pol Pot, you know, he killed a few million his, uh, as well. That he was a creation of the American bombing of Cambodia, you know, secret bombing. That's just extraordinary. Anyway, the last mm -hmm. thing America would want is for a body that was fair and just and, you know, right. imposed appropriate behaviour and stopped exploitation amongst nations above. So the... It, I hate to quote Karl Marx, but um, one of the most significant things he said is, is that the, in his terminology, the ruling classes, the interests of the ruling classes determine the contents of the consciousness of the members of society. It's an extraordinary claim, but Noam Chomsky, you know, has written a book called Manufacturing Consent. And if you follow through those processes and, and so on, then... Um, uh, you know, uh, in the UK, I mean, is it in the interests of the majority of people in the UK to have, or England have Boris Johnson, you know, as the Prime Minister? Anyway, the, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, so, yeah, that's, you know, in the 1% control uh, the belief systems that get reproduced and treated as authoritative in our current society. So against that, for, uh, you know, bottom-up bottom up processes would have to contend mm -hmm. with, their, with this conflict with the interests of established power structures in the world. Right. Um, could it happen in, you know, if we had 300 years? Yes, maybe, you know, in 20, 30 years, I don't, you know, I can't see it at all. Yeah, I see. Yeah. You know, um, well, thank you. Um, we we could end it here if you don't have time. There was one thing I wanted to ask you a bit more about aliens, but if yeah, yeah, the, no, the ask, sort of... ask me about aliens. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because <laughs> let's, um, let's get you, off the you, planet. You, let's leave it behind. Yeah, yeah, because it's go. such a mess. Because <laughs> um, yeah, you you brought it up and like like uh, you know, I mean, like to sort of frame what I wanted to say. So I was listening to uh, Eric Weinstein on Joe Rogan. He was talking about how you know. Imagine there are alien civilizations at the moment, right? When we when we release nuclear bombs and they they see they see mushroom clouds, they're like they'll look at us and be like, "What is going on here? This isn't what's supposed to." Or maybe they know it's good, it's going to happen, you know. Um, but like this is serious now, and and uh, like you know, you could say evolution has you know gone really far. So what's going on? I, I wonder, like, if if nuclear weapons and these things are so powerful, you know, is it? Do you think that if there are aliens, like they kind of already have a kind of uh, a super organism or like almost like a global governance structures already like the I don't know it's kind of a weird question I just want to start the conversation about like considering yeah. like to the degree with which <laughs> aliens you know they might have these structures already the yeah I, 
sort of hinted at that before, absolutely. Um, that, you know, these, these stages of successive uh, major evolutionary transitions, stepwise, you know, aggregating mm. entities at the previous level into cooperatives that then become integrated into mm. even larger scale cooperatives, um, the details will differ, you know, on different planets. Um, but that they, these are strange attractors. They're, they're attractors in possibility space. Um, and so the trajectory will be the same everywhere. The details will be different. The organisms, mm -hmm. you know, might be quite different. But eventually they'll get, um, you know, because once you ab abstract away, um, uh, you know, the details and see the principles, mm -hmm. then they're universal. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't talked much about evolvability, but that the mm -hmm. evolution of evol evolvability. So, you know, evolution proceeded uh, to a limited extent in in the chemical milieu before uh, you know the uh, emergence of the first cells managed by RNA, and once you have RNA, then you get mutation. So it explored possibility space through trial and error. So that that mm -hmm. was evolvability at that level. Then sexual sexual reproduction um, was actually an innovation in evolvability. It enabled recombination of genetic elements, which was more likely to uh, find beneficial adaptations in possibility space than was just blind trial and error in genetic mutation. Then you have the emergence of um, uh, in uh, humans of the of cultural evolution and some pre-human, even some uh, uh, dolphins, porpoises, um, you know, have a very limited form of cultural uh, inheritance. What that does is is that things that an organism learns during its life don't die with it any longer because they can be transmitted to other members of the uh, mm -hmm. species, including to their children. Um, and that enables the accumulation of these, uh, of discoveries that are made during the life of the organism. Before that, it was only, you know, genetic mutations and recombination. So it was an mm -hmm. extraordinary explosion of evolvability. Uh, and then the development of mental models. Um, mm -hmm. So, so this this is the development of mental models is the ability to foresee the future by modelling how things will unfold, um, and then the tra using cultural processes to transmit those discoveries to other human beings and so on. Um, the uh, and then there's levels of ability in, in mental modelling. And critically important, you know, again, you can use that trajectory to identify what the next great step in evolvability is at the individual level. Uh, and at the collective level, the global superorganism will have great, much, far greater evolvability than any individual, but particularly because individuals uh, will take this next, the next step. And the next step in human uh, intelligence is the ability to mentally model complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the first enlightenment was the emergence of the analytical rational thinking, which is the ability to uh, form mechanistic models of the world. But that only works for a limited part of reality because most of the world is far more complex than can be thought through or analysed. And so the first enlightenment was underpinned by this emergence of analytical rational cognition. It drove the development of technology um, uh, and science. The second enlightenment will involve the emergence of um, the ability to form complex mental models and to understand, therefore, the rest of reality, of reality those things that aren't analysable, including importantly, the understanding the evolutionary worldview, 
and its implications and understanding, mm -hmm. for example, vertical markets. So, mm -hmm. and even to understand horizontal markets properly, because, you know, right. horizontal markets aren't, you know, economics is, oh, you're an economist, aren't you? But, the, <laughs> but <I> econ know. <laughs> you know, economic Hopefully. systems are extraordinarily complex systems and they can't be analysed and the mathematical models used by, you know, the founders of academic economics leave out, you know, so many important factors. They don't enable mm -hmm. predictions and so on. You know, the governments that manage economies, um, uh, you know, there's no, there's no economics uh, doesn't give them certainty about how that what they should do and so on. It's a lot of trial and error and so on because mm -hmm. economics is, you know, its um, models are first enlightenment models, they're mechanistic, mathematical and so on. Mm -hmm. So to understand the evolution of worldview, to understand markets and comp any complex of society. I mean, the reason why sociology is not a science and is in the humanities is because science, it's not because sociologists are so limited it's because science is limited. Science um, is uh, is driven by analytical um, cognition, and it can't understand complexity. Therefore, the and it evaluates, you know, attempts to apply science to sociology using the limited criteria of analytical rational cognition. So, similarly, psychology is you know most of psychology, you know, rat, is rats and stats because it's powered by analytical rational cognition, can't deal with complexity and so on. In any mm -hmm. event, to get the evolutionary worldview, you, you really need, you know, uh, cognition at the second enlightenment level, which very few people on the planet have at the moment. Um, but in any event, so back to aliens. <laughs> the, the, um, <laughs> uh, yes, I've dealt... I just outlined evolvability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so this process we're involved in, when you step back and see it from a distance, uh, it's the same experience that you would have in a developing chicken embryo if you were a very intelligent cell and a group of intelligent cells who developed a science and, and eventually developed a picture of how the egg, how the embryo was developing, mm. and you would predict that it was meant to hatch. And this process right. on this planet is meant to hatch a superorganism. It's a developing embryo. So it's hard to see when you're embedded in the mm. detail and you're a cell, you know, amongst eight billion other cells and all these processes that are large in scale and you're on it. If you're analytically orientated, you know, and you think things through step by step in linear logical fashion, you'll never see the big picture. But once you step back and see the big picture, this is a developing embryo, and it's meant to hatch a global superorganism. Mm. So it's the same process, though the details will differ, on any other planet on which life emerges. They will go through these steps. They were in both in scale of cooperative organisation and in evolvabil evolvability. And they will get to the stage where they will have large scale entities on the similar scale to nations. And those, na and they'll have the technological power and so on to destroy the planet and the civilization on it. Um, including through environmental degradation. They'll encounter tragedies of the commons, you know, cooperation barriers, um, the exploitative power used exploitably, and so on. They're all totally abstract things that, you know, are universal anywhere in this universe. Um, right. And the, they will reach, you know, they'll, be powerful enough to destroy themselves, those that survive will will develop, will hatch a superorganism. They'll understand that they were 
part of all along they were part of an embryo mm. that was developing and that was destined to hatch a superorganism if it overcame these challenges. Mm -hmm. And these mm -hmm. challenges were demanding, you know, the hatching of a superorganism. Um, so they'll understand all that. And and that answers the Fermi paradox. So you've heard the Fermi paradox, mm -hmm. which is it, which is that um, you know if life isn't an extraordinarily rare event, you know that that's only on this planet, then where the hell is are all the aliens and all their civilizations, and why haven't right. we seen them? Why haven't we seen them? Um, and this answers it because there there is life everywhere. There are superorganisms. Yeah, the, the universe is of such an age that there will be superorganisms that have hatched all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, and any, so the ones that are, you know, capable of communicating with us, as opposed to the ones who don't develop a global system to combat the self-destructive tendency and therefore blink out of ex existence, you know, in an infinitesimal, you know, from industrialization to now is what, 400 years or something? 400 mm. years in cosmic time is nothing, unnoticeable, unnoticed. So the ones that persist through time and that can, can contact us and so on, they're ones that are superorganisms. Um, they're ones that have been through this process successfully. They're ones that know that the existential threats that are threatening us, and mm -hmm. including nuclear war, that that they're essential for the hatching of a global superorganism. Yes, they might destroy, you know, the possibility of a superorganism, mm -hmm. and and will destroy it not just in the short term. There'll be no bouncing back quickly, because the yolk of the egg, the yolk of the egg that's necessary to produce a superorganism is fossil fuels. So fossil fuels are responsible for our built environment. You know, none of mm -hmm. this could happen without fossil fuels because they've, they provided the energy source to get us technology, everything that exists now. Mm -hmm. We're, we're using it up. We've used it up. The yolks, you know, peak yolk <laughs> has mm -hmm. arguably passed. Um, therefore, um, you know, there'll be no bouncing back, you know, within right. millions and millions and millions of years because the yolk will take billions of years probably to replenish and there'll be no industrialization and so on, no hatching of the super and so on. So, so. The alien superorganisms that have, they know this process we're embedded in. They know that to hatch, then they can't intervene and solve these problems for us because their solution to the problems would prevent, you know, the organic process needed for us to develop a superorganism, embrace an evolutionary worldview, develop the mm, superorganism and so on. So the, they they would, you know, it's like us interfering in a chicken embryo. Yeah, they can't force us to do it. That's interesting. Yeah, we have to kind of do it ourselves. That's, okay, go, go. Yeah, I mean, that, no, that's it. So okay. that's, that's so when we become a superorganism, um, uh, they'll contact us. They'll be, mm. because they'll be, you know, imagine you're a superorganism somewhere else and you're, yeah, there's no one to talk to on this planet. There, there, there is no entity to talk to. There's just these mm. idiot, idiot, uh, like children throwing tantrums, which are current nation states. You know, they're dumb as batshit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, incompetent at everything they they do, and they, you know, they go to war, which is so ridiculous. It's like your left arm, you know, attacking your right arm, and so on. It's an autoimmune disease, but mm -hmm. 
except there is no organism that has the immune system. There's there's no organism. There's no one to, for them to talk to. Yeah. So, um, so that's why we, you know. Yeah. We don't. I see that. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, 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 um, one question I had. That, so that's very interesting. Um, like uh, one question I had actually, like before even when I the, one reason I brought up the aliens was like I wonder if. Like, do you think that, like, superorganisms would, um, like, go to war against other aliens? Like, like maybe there would be actually competition between, like, planets? Like, um, like, is there a case for or against why that would happen? Or, like, if there is a yeah. global, like, a... Absolutely. So, absolutely. They, they know the trajectory of evolution. They know that to survive and thrive, they have to continue along that trajectory. The trajectory is towards the formation of cooperatives of larger and larger scale, mm -hmm. um, not by going to war, you know, and risking every, everything. Mm -hmm. um, so so that, that's the fundamental difference. Once you hatch a suit, the superorganism knows about cooperation, knows about tragedy of the commons, knows that, you know, altruism is inhibited, knows that how to overcome the cooperation barrier, you know, including by, you know, uh, intentionally and swiftly setting up supra-global organism governance and so on, constraining, you know, so that so that you can't be taken advantage of and, and so on, implementing governance and constraints that ensure cooperation pays for everyone, you know, all the global superorganisms. And that so there'll be, mm -hmm, see. You know, yeah. So on, on, on it'll go. Now, is the speed of light the you know can it ever be overcome? Yeah, you know, can there ever be anything faster? I don't know. But if if it was, then maybe maybe the universe gets unified mm -hmm. eventually. Mm -hmm. You know, to have a universal superorganism, it might you know to an extent. The, I say in one of my papers that it gets to be as unimaginable to us, you know, what where where it all ends up, or what mm. if if it does hatch a universe superorganism, what it then does. It's un, as unimaginable to us as a bacterium in our gut developing the science, you know, to to eventually understand what our love life is. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, so so there'll always be horizons that you know for any living organism. I see. There is one yeah. final thing, by the way. By the way, I, I think I'll slip. Have you got another um, ten minutes or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, the the evolutionary worldview, the evolutionary understanding that I've, I've outlined, basically says that you know when a universe like ours comes into existence then it's understandable and predictable not in detail but in terms of um, the general trajectory you know where life emerges and forms larger and larger scale cooperatives and so on um, that's understandable so it can answer where do we come from question starting with you know the universe coming into existence what mm. we are and where we're going to you know it can answer that but it doesn't answer the there's still an un, unanswerable question an ineradicably <clears throat> mysterious question you know why is there something rather than nothing and the mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. So there is a fundamental mystery, and um, you know, are there are there these wider scale processes? Are we organisms that then have all you know lives interacting with other organisms that arise in other universes and so on and so on? And what's it all about? Why why did mm -hmm. it always come about? You know, so we can understand it within certain bounds, but outside those bounds, everything's possible. And uh, and there's an infinite number of possible hypotheses that are consistent with, you know, any known facts. That's what Karl Popper 
had at the centre of his philosophy of science that um, explaining known facts is not science in itself. If that's all you can do, mm-hmm. you've got to you've got to have a bold hypothesis that predicts something new and that, that's falsifiable and so on. And there are things that and until you do that, you have an infinite number of possible explanations for any known set of facts, including about the universe. So there is some ineradicable mystery there. But one thing that's occurred to me with the development of AI, um, because yeah, I don't think chat GPT is sentient. It hasn't got human level intelligence. It's nowhere near human level intelligence. Mm. And I, I won't go into too much detail about that, but I'm amongst those who would say that chat GPT is a stochastic parrot and a sophisticated autocomplete system. All it does is use all the written materials and so on, and now films, videos and so on, uh, available to it on the internet and so on, to uh, work out that uh, in a string of symbols, what would, based on all its inputs, what would be probable to follow that that string of symbols. That's all it all it does. And it's extraordinary what that can achieve, but that's all it does. In any event, the thinking about AI, uh, even AI, virtual reality and so on, um, you know, because I'm vitally interested in, uh, you know, finding ways to promote the, 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 to scaffold the level of cognition in individuals that will produce the second enlightenment. That is cognition that's capable of understanding complexity because nearly all our current attempts um, to develop a science of complexity are in fact analytical rational reductions of complexity. So they don't capture or understand complexity. Um, you know, they're mathematical models that are uh, analytical rational. So because I'm vitally interested in how to you know, scaffold higher levels of um, cognition and, and so on, social emotional development, um, you know, it, it, an idea which is fairly obvious and is starting to be implemented to some extent is that you can structure um, intelligent virtual reality in ways that will scaffold development um, you know, to participants in that virtual reality and whether it be games or whatever, through games or whatever, mm. it'll, it, so the, for example, it can give you experiences that promote um, uh, the development of new capacities and skills mm. um, that, is, that, that you couldn't, that it can give you experiences that you couldn't encounter an ordinary life because you would be, um, uh, you know, because they're too dangerous or whatever. So, mm-hmm. uh, interesting. So exposure therapy um, and challenges, it's a bit like the development of a superorganism requires crises, existential threats. The development of human individuals affected yeah. how requires crises and challenges. Yeah, if you, can you simulate that? Yeah, go on. Yeah, so you can simulate it. So mm. a function of, of um, uh, virtual reality and AI, uh, virtual reality could be to mm. promote development. And then it occurred to me that um, the, to, to develop super intelligent AI, arguable, it's strongly arguable, I think, Viveki says significant part of this um, that you need uh, it needs to go through the developmental process and the developmental levels that human beings go through. Um, you can't yeah, short, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't short circuit it, you know, because they're not analyzable, probably non, not computable either. They're probably um, mm. computer, computationally irreducible. Um, you know, the processes that have gone through and so on. So it has to learn by experience. So it's got to go through levels. So you've got to scaffold the levels. It's even arguable that you actually have to uh, 
that you can't just start with a single cell because we there's no way in the world we can build a single cell program a single cell in any mm -hmm. way whatsoever um so where do you start you might have to start with the universe so the only way arguably to create super intelligent ai um is to start with the universe um start in, with the universe it'll then go through all these developmental phases evolutionary transitions hatching a you know a global super organism and so on so i call this a, a sandbox universe so the the only way you can develop you know uh super intelligent ai is to simulate a universe set off the whole evolutionary process and the entities that emerge in that universe won't realize you know that that out up into our stage they won't realize that that they could be uh the products of a sandbox sandbox universe a simulation uh -huh. um but when they start to develop ai and come to the realization that for them to develop super intelligent AI or even human level AI, that not only will it have to go to kindergarten, you know, and have parents and social interactions and all that sort of stuff to go through the Piaget stages of cognitive development, it'll actually have to start with a universe, you know, a simulation of the beginning of the universe and so on. And when they come to that realization, they'll highly likely come to the realization that they might be in a sandbox universe yeah just as we uh, some of us are coming to the realization that we might be in a sandbox universe so mm -hmm. this is fast go, go on i don't know stop no you. no that's that's it that's it that's well no, that's that's fascinating. I mean, one thing like it reminds me of is, I mean, even like uh, Isaac Asimov's the last question of like, uh, I mean, the view that, for example, you talked about is the universe, would it be kind of a global cooperative organization or like that's what it would turn into like one super organism. And um, one thing you talked about is about like, why do we have a universe over, over say, say nothing. So is it, it's, it, am I right? I'm just trying to understand you maybe um, is like, um, the case that the universe is at the right level of kind of um, organization. So like people would actually, that would be the thing people would want to create is universes. Um, like if they wanted to simulate, if they wanted to to help have things be super organisms. Um, like I'm just trying to think about uh, why why universes like emerge um, and how, for example, like in, in physics, like the fact that it seems, you know, maybe like there are many kind of multiverse theories about like, like it perhaps through black holes like there are other universes right maybe so um because you know it's funny that to keep going what, what you know the book that's kind of uh, i don't know if you've read called the romance of reality uh um, from uh, bobby Azarian. yeah 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 the um no but i know what he's done right sure and, him and he's he um yeah he, in the, i don't know if you saw his uh, recent email that went out but he said that he'd um i think he said regrettably he hadn't um included evolution's arrow in his um, book so oh, right yeah so i don't know whether that means that he didn't know um about evolution's arrow or or what but he he, re he refers to francis haligan who's the head of the research group that i'm a member of um mm -hmm. so in any event yeah his his the, he hasn't he hasn't got this mechanism so so Tehard de Chardin um you know back mm. 70 or 80 years ago um you know developed uh the this big picture um view of evolution the evolutionary process um and noted this successive aggregation process that starts actually before life so you get yeah, yeah yeah so and then he extended it to life and said you get a a global newsphere um mm -hmm. and so on and basically bobby azarian's updated that 
Um, so it's it's finding a pattern. Uh, but to be acceptable to science, as I said, it's got to not just be a pattern because clouds in the sky, you know, can have patterns. The the issue is to identify the causal mechanisms that uh, explain a pattern. And until you have the causal mechanisms, you can't um, under, you can't extrapolate either. And of course, Teilhard de Chardin's extrapolation sort of falls off a cliff. Um, partly because he he was you know Roman Catholic and and uh, had to arguably operate within the constraints of Catholic beliefs and so on, but so so Teilhard de Chardin's a teleological view, which is a bit like Ken Wilber's um, uh, developmental th stuff as well. Ken Wilber, extraordinarily, actually doesn't believe. Um, that natural selection, you know, has produced the evolution of organisms. He believes in a force called eros that pulls things into existence. So that's mm. tele teleology is backward causation, you know, where, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the end, the end, uh, an end result calls into existence things along the way. And I've used that language a bit, but metaphorically only, not... Yeah. <laughs> so where what I saw myself doing with, you know, my papers and Evolution's Arrow, in effect, was um, taking Teilhard de Chardin's uh, pattern and scientising it, in other words... Mm identifying the causal mechanisms that move forward and drive it forward without any pull from the future. Uh, so, and, and hence management theory, you know, you need an explanation for how these cooperatives emerge and how the cooperation barrier, you know, which is central uh, to evolutionary science, you know, the, up till now, the primacy of self-interest the selfish gene and so on. So you've got to counter that. You know, you can't just say, ah, oh, you know, it comes into existence. You know, you, so Bobby Azarian, as I understand what he's done, he, he's Tehard de Shardy and like, and mm -hmm. he actually explicitly says he has a teleological view where the ends determine what happens. Um, and he can't extrapolate or, you know, uh, hasn't got the concept of intentional evolution or seen the need for us to build a, a global superorganism and so on. But in broad outline, very similar and resonant, you know, with my sort of stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, but, yeah, again, I don't think he's uh, yeah. yet developed it into something like the Evolutionary Manifesto, which right, says... Right says that it's a belief system um, that once you understand it will identify for you how you should live your life. Right, right. In, in, de yeah, in yeah. some detail. No, that, that's right. Like, like it's interesting you've been there up. Like, thanks for kind of um, going through that because, um, yeah, he, he talks about how, like, well, like, like life is kind of inevitable, you know, in fact, because it, it becomes from even deeper processes like the second law of thermodynamics where we have these systems. But he kind of talks about if humans want to survive, we're again, we need to be careful. We need to do things. But he doesn't kind of go actively like, no, like where I mean, it, it, it's weird because, again, he does talk about it in a theological fashion, like like in a way in which there is an ultimate force of, of complexification, um, mm. but it's just not whether humans will be part of it. And you're you're more like like, yeah, we need to, we, we should. Like we have like almost duty to actively do that um, and actively um, help encourage this this cooperation. Um, okay, so one final thing is like the reason why I kind of brought up like you know um, black holes and and like why why it's it, why it was so fascinating that you you were saying that like 
you would actually create like a universe if you wanted to say teach AI you'd actually have to create like a simulated universe like you, the only way like again with John Favicki you can't algorithmically tell it what to do mm. you would kind of have to in an embodied fashion learn um it's it's in Bobby Azarian he is it's fascinating in his book but at the end he's kind of like like I guess everyone you know he's like I don't I don't know the why this would have started in the first place though mm. right I am like like I have I have no idea why there's something rather than nothing and that's why it's fascinating that you brought it up um, and it's still, again, it's still hard to, it's, you're not giving a final answer either, but it's then fascinating to think about why like a universe emerges. So anyway, I don't know if there's much deeper we can go, but yeah, you have anything no. to say. <laughs> no, and that's, that's right. There are, there will, I, in a paper, I um, delivered a, a conference in Paris, I think in 2008, called, the papers, um, the meaning of life in a developing universe. And I point out there that, yeah, we, there'll always be horizons. There's no conceivable thing that could happen that could answer this irreducible mystery in the sense that, you know, if some something that purported to be an organism from some other universe contacted us or whatever, then how would you ever verify what it you know, and so on. So it's just, mm. yeah, I think there is an irreducible mystery. Um, and that has some significance because it it says you can't, uh, yeah, the fact there's an irreducible mystery to me doesn't invalidate the, the, the answers that the evolutionary worldview gives. And that is that we're in a universe uh, where development um, Mm. Uh, is critical, and so that, and that, and then the question becomes: How do you develop, and how do you promote your own development, the development of your societies, and so on? But um, so I think it all takes off from there. But it might all be futile, you know. There's um, uh, we don't know, but all we can do is act as if um, you know it, it does make sense. Uh, given the patterns and mechanisms that we see yeah i think i don't know if you um know um someone called brett anderson uh evolutionary psychologist no well so i could send you some things of his i actually did a podcast with him so i could send you that but basically yeah. it might um, the reason why i bring it up now I would have just told you after the the sh that i stopped recording but i think it might even help answer like why we should participate in the process because he he's he makes cases um pretty strong arguments that like I mean that that this that participating basically he makes arguments that we should like that the process of participating in, in basically Bobby Azarian's complexification processes process or you know this cooperation process that that you that which is the same thing essentially um, that this is actually biologically optimal and he and uh, like 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 he talks about our concept it's kind of complicated but you know he talks about our conceptions of of mythological stories and God is actually like the um, narr mythological narratives about participating in this process and there's also evidence that like biological organisms they they function optim optimally at points at which they are best participating in this complexification process such as in self-organized criticality and ways in which you can complexify your say evolvability and things like that actually like it's it's in sort of a metaphysics of an ontology of like how to promote life like actually is optimal right and he's yeah. developing again i'm going to it but he's doing also developing philosophies with nietzsche and things about about um a philosophy of of like you know it's it's a life like life affirming right um even going beyond the religions that at the moment um so it might be interesting for you to look into that um yeah. it's definitely really converged i mean he, he cites you right he, he writes a loads about you so um it would even be interesting to get you two together um uh, yeah yeah because yeah. because that that whole area of human development, cognitive development, uh, and critically important, becoming a self-evolving being where you can um, free yourself from the constraints of your past evolution in, you know, insofar as it's set up your emotional system and your predispositions and so on. Free yourself so that you can move and be motivated to move in whatever direction uh, helps the further development of the the process along the evolutionary trajectory 
that's, you know, yeah, I've done a lot of stuff on that and it involves meditation and adopting practices from the uh, world's religious and contemplative traditions and so on and reinterprets, yeah, spiritual development and so on. But so lots of stuff there, but yeah, yeah. We're, we're this, uh, it's time to end. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Um, well, yeah, thank you very much, John. Um, this has been great. Um, I'll, um, I'll, uh, I mean, is there anything, any resources or places they can find you? I'll, I'll put some of your books in the description and, but yeah. Yeah. My web, you've got the link to my website, evolution. Yeah. I'm sure I can get that. Yeah. 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 Put evolutionary manifesto into Google and, and, uh, it will come. Yeah. So wonderful. Yeah. It's been really interesting talking to you and, um, uh, yeah, I've thought as an economist, you know, we'd be dealing yeah. with just the economic stuff, but I'm so happy that we've dealt with the big picture. But but the big picture requires a lot of words and and yeah. and the words won't create the mental models in a person's mind necessarily that, that will enable them to understand the evolutionary worldview, but that but it's it helps scaffold it. So yeah, yeah, really wonderful to meet mm. you and talk with you. Great. Yeah, and you. Yeah, it's been great. I know. I, I, I said like I wanted to look into the economics of it. Um, I did that and and a bit more. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, it's been great though. So thank you. Wonderful. Awesome. Also okay. recording. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, appreciate it.